I talked about To Kill a Mockingbird a little bit earlier. We have some clips from To Kill a Mockingbird now. Um, both the book and the movie have exactly the same relationships, which is rare um, that all the dramatic relationships maintain themselves the same. Uh, has anyone here not seen To Kill a Mockingbird or is not familiar with the movie? Uh, are you familiar with it or not? Okay, basically, um, as a setup, in the 1930s uh, South, uh, there's a very prejudicial town filled with very prejudicial people, and the black man has been wrongly accused of raping a white girl. And assigned as the public defender is Atticus, the righteous lawyer who believes in fairness and equality for everyone. So he's going to make sure he gets a fair trial no matter what, whereas the rest of the town just wants to lynch the guy. Even though he's been wrongly accused, they don't even care. They just know black men accused of rape lynching, okay, and that's the way it goes. So the story is basically about him and the father of the white girl, who's the one who's the rabble rouser, the one trying to get the head of the lynch mob, trying to get everything happening. Um, and the father of the white girl uh, named Bob Ewell, who goes with this Atticus character, who's played by Gregory Peck in the movie. And those two are battling it out as protagonists and antagonists of the story. But the story's not, as I said, told through the eyes of Atticus. It's told through the eyes of his young daughter, Scout. And there's another character that you'll see in here as well, um, who is the obstacle character that we talked about. The protagonist is Atticus. Let me just write these down here. Not that you can't get it yet, but <laughs> it gives me something to do. Okay, makes, makes the board worth having rented. Okay, so, okay, the protagonist is Ant Atticus, Ant Atticus, Okay, Gregory Peck in it. And then you have the antagonist, who is Bob Ewell, who is the father of the white girl, who is a sensible rape. And then you have Scout, Atticus's young daughter, beauty. And uh, she is the main character. And then, as we'll see, there is the obstacle character, or impact, or influence character, also in the story. And I'll, we'll just introduce them as, we, as they come. So we're going to look at this clip now, and after each section of it, I'll talk a moment about it. And when we've gone through this illustration of these different character parts, some of which usually combine to make a hero, then we'll listen on our hero and our villain, deconstruct them, and reconstruct them in different ways. So here's um, some stuff from To Kill a Mockingbird. The main character. Now notice how filmically they're in very close with her, very tight. Throughout the whole movie, they stay in close with her. See things from her point of view. Even when action takes place, it tends to see her reaction to it if she's not there. We don't actually see the action. We're looking through her eyes most of the time. Okay? So that's that's how you can tell the main character is that they're presented as we see things from their point of view mostly. Now notice here, he's the protagonist defending the black man. But look, we see him behind other people. We see him in a long shot in the distance. Throughout the story, it's done that way with him as well. Did you have from that door, Mr. Finch? What? I think you ought to turn right around and go back home. I think it takes around here somewhere. Okay, let's just stop there for a second. You'll notice the difference between the main character and the protagonist. The protagonist is the one who's leading the charge, the one who's trying to achieve the goal, the one who's trying to accomplish the story goal. The main character is the one through whose eyes we experience the story as if we're actually there. We're watching Atticus. We're not identifying. We, we find things with him to identify with, but we're not actually identifying with him. We identify with Scout. We feel that we are looking through Scout's eyes. The story seems to be about Scout's view of these events, not about Atticus's view of these events. Okay? Can they be the same? They can, and in a hero, that's exactly what they do. They have the protagonist and the main character combined. That's the most common thing. So when you see Die Hard, for example, okay, that's a, a, a time when you see the protagonist, the one leading the charge, is also the one through whose eyes we experience the story. Uh, nothing wrong with it, but that's 90% of the time that's what's done. But not here, not in this story. Let's take a, a look at now the, uh, the antagonist. Hi, hi, Captain. Mr. Ewell. Captain, I, I'm real sorry they picked you to defend that nigga that raped my man I don't know why I didn't kill him myself instead of going to the sheriff. No, it saved you and the sheriff and the taxpayers lost trouble. Mr. Ewell, Ewell I'm very Hey, Captain, I, somebody told me just now that uh, they thought that you would leave Tom Robinson's story again, Iron. I said, I said, 
you wrong, man. You dead wrong. Miss Pinch ain't taking this jury against Iron. Well, they were wrong, wasn't they? I've been appointed to defend Tom Robinson. Now that he's been charged, that's what I intend to do. You've taken his jury. Excuse me, Mr. What kind of man are you? You got to join him your own. Okay, now notice that when that was filmed, there was side shots. Okay, cinematically, they knew in making the film what these characters' relationships were. It's protagonist and antagonist, and they're showing them, and from the distance, a little bit standoff, like that general view. I mean, it's not like you're way the hell out of there, but you're, you're actually just looking at them a little bit objectively and seeing how they relate to one another, how they hammer it out, how they bang it out. But when we're a scout, we're right in there in the story with it. Yes. But in a screenplay, we're more or less forbidden to give direction. You bet you are. <laughs> and that's the important thing to recognize is that, that in a screenplay, unlike a novel, the audience is not your audience. Uh, in a screenplay, the audience is the cast and crew. Okay. That's what you write for in a screenplay. You write for the cast and crew. And they will, like a game of telephone, they will interpret your work for the audience. You never are allowed to speak to the audience directly. If anything you actually put down shows up exactly as you had it, <laughs> it's a miracle, okay? Miracle film productions. If it's any good, it's a miracle. But, um, okay, so the thing is that it, it's, it's a miracle if you, if you actually get something through. Um, the best thing you can do is try to create a sense where what you felt, what you wanted to achieve, the impact that you wanted to have on the audience, if you can imbue that into your um, uh, cast and crew, so that they become impassioned by what your vision was, then, in fact, they'll be true to your vision, but not necessarily true to your your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, maybe tomorrow, or, or you know, we can touch on it. But I have in my storyline, it starts out, and the hero is an ordinary man. So he's, you know, in, in my vision, he's filmed so that you see his entire stature. And as it gets through the first and the second act, you see, like, you know, less of his feet, and you, he's a little closer. And toward the end, all you see is his face. I mean, you know, in every scene that, that is him is just the face. Yeah. So he has become so much larger, mm -hmm. you know, than, than life and larger than he started out to be. Right. Maybe tomorrow we'll get into it. Well, I don't know how to I, say I, I, that. I your, point is, your point is on, on how do you get that across in a screenplay specifically. Yes. The fact of the matter is, when they say that screenplay has to be a certain way, that doesn't really apply to everyone. It applies to the person who's sending in things who are unknowns, who've never proven themselves, who are trying to get um, somebody to read their stuff and trying to get it into the studio system. They're going to look and see, okay, is there a major turning point somewhere around the middle of the story? You know, they're not even going to bother to read the whole thing first. They, they may read a, a cover sheet, if you want to put a cover sheet, and you can do an awful lot with a cover sheet of talking about things like that if you want to. But aside from that, in the screenplay, no, they're looking for quote-unquote proper form. Nobody in Hollywood writes with proper form once they're a working writer, okay? Once you're a working writer, you want to make sure it's formatted properly, but as far as whether it can be literary or not, I mean, um, you look at uh, some of the greatest writers of, of screenplays, and they completely break what's supposed to be the form, and they write it like a book. As a matter of fact, um, I was just mentioning to my son the other day that um, Harlan Ellison uh, wrote a, a screenplay based on iRobot, uh, Isaac Asimov's novel. And it was a brilliant screenplay, but it was never produced. They couldn't raise the money. But the screenplay was such a good work of literary art that they actually published it as a book, and it sold pretty well. So the thing is, here's a screenplay based on a, a book that was a big seller that in its own right became a big seller just as, as literary art for the masses, not for people um, who were just in the industry. So being literary screenplay, putting in camera directions, if you're working in a studio system and you have strict requirements, you have to toe the line of whatever they say. But if you're writing as a freelancer to get things done, if you get any kind of recognition, then you can start pushing that envelope and be as literary as you want to put in as many techniques. If you're writing to direct for yourself that you're going to be directing, or you're working with a partner that you know is going to be directing, that will be the case where you can put in all kinds of stuff as part of the collaboration. But if you're writing to just put something through the system and you don't have recognition and you're unknown, then at first you have to toe the line and not put those things in and maybe save those kinds of stories, your pet project, for 10 years down the line when you've got some credits behind you. Okay. <laughs>
That's right. You want to fill it up. That's right. That's right. But but that's you know everyone starting in any business is limited. First they want to see how well you can do like in, in figure skating. How well can you do the uh, the mandatory exercises? You know, and then go out and do the ice dancing. You know, it's like they don't want to just see if you can ice dance. You also have to do those things. So even for the professionals, they want to see that you can do that, that you know what you're doing. Okay. But if you get enough name for yourself, they just assume you can do that. And then if you're doing something different, they see it as art instead of a mistake. Uh, in fifth grade class, uh, creative writing, one time, I had this teacher who was really into creative writing, and I put in an intentional sentence fragment. I said, um, you know, something like, um, uh, I can't remember what it was, but anyway, I put in a sentence fragment, and I put it in there intentionally because I wanted to jolt the reader. I wanted them to stop and go, oh wow, that's, that's like uh, really abrupt, okay? And so she uh, downgraded me on it, and I came up and I said afterwards, well, no, I did this for this purpose. And she said, this is fifth grade, you're not supposed to know how to do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing in screenplays, you know. It, when you have a name for yourself, when they figure you're a higher grade, then you can play around with it. Until then, you're not supposed to know how to do that yet. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, anyway, now we've seen this clip. We have one more to see, which is the obstacle character. Who's the obstacle character? Anybody have a, a clue who the obstacle character is? And, oh, yes. But Boo Radley. Boo Radley, right, right. And, and we'll talk about why in a moment. First we're going to see why, and then we'll talk about why. The scout, again, close in with her, different than we saw Bob Ewell and Atticus. Close in with this, giving an indication there's the personal relationship, that personal interplay, that personal ur argument or skirmish that's happened between them over the course of the story is resolving now in a very personal way. Mm -hmm. Mr. Arthur Bradley. Totally different than when Bob Ewell and Ewell, he's behind another person. The protagonist clearly shows you he's not the main character. This is who we're experiencing the story through. Stop. Thank you. Okay, so we now have these four characters, these four points of view, and there was a reason for splitting them in that particular story. Here's the reason. Atticus is very self-righteous. He's very much against prejudice. And if we stood in his shoes, we would be standing in the shoes of the self-righteous character, who's the main character, going, well, aren't we self-righteous? Aren't we wonderful that we're all against prejudice? And we experience the story, but with no sense of change in ourselves. Harper Lee, who wrote the story, did something very, very clever. Scout, and through her eyes, through her ears, and, and her seeds, we hear about this boogeyman character named Boo Radley who lives under the house down the street, you know, and he's this spooky figure who eats little children and, you know, uh, does all these terrible things. And he's this very evil, scary guy. We've never seen him. She's never seen him. Nobody's ever seen him. All the other kids talk about him. She buys into it. We buy into it. In fact, we are completely prejudiced against Boo Radley from the get-go. We're suckered into it, even while we're watching the story of prejudice. We are prejudiced against Boo Radley, and we've never even seen him. We're just accepting hearsay. People that we trust, people that we care about, people we have an emotional attachment to us are telling us this guy's uh, terrible, and so we buy into it. And at the end of the story, it turns out Boo Radley is the one who is actually protecting them from the antagonist, Bob Ewell, who wanted to kill the kids in retribution for Atticus's efforts uh, to save the, the, uh, the, the black man. So he's, he's actually trying. In fact, Boo Radley's been protecting the kids all the time. When they lose something, he brings it up at night when he comes out and leaves it on their doorstep when they've lost something. He watches over them, and if there's any danger there, he's taken care of it in the seams and protected them times they didn't even know they were in danger. And in the end, he actually physically does it by killing Bob Ewell, and in so doing, has now uh, totally protected the kids, and basically, Bob Ewell fell on his own knife, uh, says the sheriff, you know, and uh, I guess there's no witnesses, so that's the way it is, sort of like that. And, uh, and they end up letting him on because they know he was just protecting the kids, even though he's the one who, who killed them, okay? So the thing is that her opinion in the end has changed. And she, and through her we, have realized, maybe not at the conscious level, but subconsciously, that we are all capable of being prejudiced because Harper Lee just made us that way with a little simple hearsay about the local movie man. And we didn't realize that he was actually the protector and the guardian for these children. Well, that's what prejudice is. So by splitting it, it's the only way that story could have been done that way. If we were in Atticus's shoes, we never could have gotten that message. At least subliminally, at least subconsciously, we walk away feeling, oh, I guess those that we think that are one way may turn out to be some other way. And that's all that the story is really about in terms of its message. 